record on this. So again, this is the Abuja Literary Society. It's our book jam events. Today we have your one day Omoto show. So your Omoto show, show? Omoto show is what I've been okay, yeah. brought up on. Omoto show, yeah. You know, because some people try to use, some people use the S as, yeah. So I wasn't, I wasn't mm -hmm. sure. Omoto show. Yeah. So lovely to have you. Thank you for agreeing to, to be here. So again, this is ALS. We have some regulars in the room. So what we usually do for the Book Jam event is that we, first of all, talk about a little bit about our weeks, you know, in, in way of introduction, just to sort of unwind and distress. So, um, yeah, so maybe if, I don't know who can speak. Uh, Adlo, are you able to speak? Just introduce yourself. Tell us about the week that you've had. And, you know, I, I know this week is this weekend is expected to be a very political one in Nigeria because we may be having primary elections, but we're not sure they're going to hold. So maybe mm -hmm. your expectations for this weekend and what you're going to do, are you going to just hide out in your house <laughs> and avoid all of the drama? Hi, Tilly. Hello, everyone. Hi. <laughs> How are you doing? Well, right. I've had a very um, slow week. Um my blood pressure was all over the place so i needed to take some time off to rest so i've been at home since on wednesday but i do have plans for the weekend um the kids have a birthday party so i plan to go there to relax a little tomorrow so yes okay that is it from me <laughs> sounds good mm-hmm Sounds good. Kabura Zakama, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kabura Zakama. I um, consider myself uh, a poet and um, an encourager of writing in indigenous languages. For my weekend, I intend to read up um, Believers and Hustlers, which I've started uh, earlier in the week, but I also hope to do some writing as well. So I'm happy to uh, listen today to Yewande. I was trying to get her book. I haven't been able to lay hands on it yet. So I will still try and look for it this weekend. Probably I'll go to the bookshops. The unusual grief, interesting to read, I think. Over. Thank you, Kabur. I think it's a Robin Heights actually. So you can check with them. Um, uh, John, are you there? Right here. Um, very slow week. Very sorry to hear that you are no longer doing the poetry online. And I'm just looking forward to the book discussion. All right. So we still do the poetry online. So the book jam, uh, some Fridays are, uh, so you know, we it's arranged per quarter. So every three months we have a discussion with an author, we have a workshop, and then we have a poetry event. So you're in luck, you know. So the next the next month is gonna be a poetry event online. So you can join that as well. But it's good to have you. Um Sanusi, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Good evening, everyone. Hi, Tenny. Um, so like she said, or like it says on the screen, my name is Sanusi. And um, I mean for the weekend i don't think i have anything particularly planned besides just um you know holding up in the house and following the primaries online basically seeing what's going on and how the drama <laughs> is faring and everything and finally hopefully we'll have front runners for each political parties so we'll know what to look forward to yeah, yeah that's it yeah I mean, I think you're more hopeful than others because there's some concerns that, I mean, I just saw something just literally now that perhaps INEC is going to um, is going to extend the, the deadline for submitting candidates. So we see everything that they do. Anyway, it's good to have you. I think we've gone, okay, wait, uh, Faith. Faith, you are the first to join the meeting. I don't know if you can talk. That's Alayan de Faith Adjoke. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Hey, Faith. Yes, Alayan de Faith Adjoke. I'm actually, I'm from Lagos. 
Okay. So yeah, I showed the. Did you get me? Yes, I did. You're in Lagos. Yes, I'm in Lagos, so I joined the meeting. So I, this is my first time with the Abuja Literary, Literary Society. <laughs> so I just keep my ears open. You're welcome, Faith. And yeah, that's why we kept this last one online so people could still join us from, from wherever. Blessing John. Yes, Blessing John, are you there? Or if, okay, yes. Uh, hi, hey, hi everyone. I joined, I just joined a couple of minutes ago, so I don't know what the question is, what everyone is responding to, but I'm in Abuja. I think people are talking about where they are, am I right? Yeah, introductions and then how was your week and what are you looking forward to this weekend? Oh, okay. Um, my name is Blessing John, like he says, I'm in Abuja. Um, my week was stressful, mm. but it was fine. And I'm looking forward to resting this weekend. That's it. All right. It's good to have you, Blessing. I think um, we have Yinka Babalola. Yinka. Hi. Hey. Hi. Yeah, I'm Yinka. Um, I'm in Abuja as well. So my week was relatively easy. Yeah, it wasn't that stressful. And um, I guess my weekend is going to be a bit busy, which is interesting. So it's it's flipped the other way around. Yeah. So yeah, that's all. All right. It's good to have you, Yinka. Your name is, sounds very familiar. I don't know if we know each other from some other space, but it's good to have you here. Uh, we Thank still have you. Uche Arinze. Hi, Uche, are you able to talk? Can we know you? <laughs> As we say. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Uh, okay, I just joined the club and um, I saw this post and followed the link to this meeting. Okay. Is there anything specifically I have to talk about? So you're in, I mean, okay, so we've seen your name already, but then how was your week and what are you looking forward to this weekend? Oh, my week was was kind of boring, actually. <laughs> but nothing unusual, just the same old stuff, nothing out of the usual. So I'm looking forward to an exciting weekend. All right. It's good to have you here. Um, I you. wish my week was boring. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing I love more than having nothing to do, but it's good to have you here. I think we've gone around the room. That's if, uh, yeah, more or less. Michael, there's someone called Michael. Michael, <laughs> Michael, can you introduce yourself? Can we hear you? Hello, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Yeah, Michael Zeno, um, a poet, book word artist. Actually, I Joyce uh, just joined from Kaduna. Yeah. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, is this Thank your you. first time? No, 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 it's not my first time. I've been in attendance anytime I'm in Abuja, so I do attend the ALS meeting. Events. Okay, all right. So the poetry events. Okay, that's that's great. I'm sure yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll have um, Suleiman, Suleiman Abubakar. So Leiman, in case you're confused, we're just introducing ourselves, oh. talking about our weeks and then our weekends. Oh, okay. My name is Suleiman Abubakar. Uh, I used to attend the book club in, when I was in Abuja, but I'm currently in Lagos. Okay. So I'm currently in Lagos studying to be a banker. Okay. That is what is going on. Then my week has been quite busy, but I will not bore you with the details. <laughs> you may proceed. <laughs> Okay, so maybe one of these days you write the details in a poem and then you perform them for us at um, at ALS when you're in Abuja. Yeah, but I mean, it's have nice. you. yeah, it's good to have. I mean, that's what poetry is for, isn't it? It's good to have you here. Uh, so we'll take like two more people. So Pehello, Pehello, you were you? I mean, it would be good to uh, hear from you. Just how was your week? You know, and what are you looking forward to this weekend? Hi, my name is Pierre Lohm. Uh, um, 
so many things, an author and a publisher and other things. Um, I'm, I'm not doing much this weekend. Um, yeah, I've, I've given myself an, a weekend off. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Davidson. Yeah. Davidson, I can see your hand is up. You haven't introduced yourself. So please go ahead. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Uh, my name is my name is Davidson Iziala. Um a writer. I'm a writer, a poet, uh, a spoken word artist, and a little bit more more. And well, this weekend has been, I don't know. What I am planning to achieve this weekend is I'm starting a new book, The Cry of Josephine. Mm. And this book is uh, based, on, based on horror, romance, and has a little bit spiced up with a little bit of a comedy. And the book's perspective is not what people call, well, you know, we have many writers and their uh, angles of writing, but yeah. the brief summary of the book is about a girl, Josephine, and you know, normally every writer has this prospect of when somebody suffers in the beginning, then definitely the person is succeeding maybe at the end of the book. But this one, she's not actually mm. a girl who suffers at the end of the day she dies. So, well, the book is still in progress and I yeah. hope you will enjoy it once I'm through. Okay. I mean, it's great to have you, Davidson, as, as always. And I'm glad that you're working on something new. So perhaps you can read uh, an excerpt um, at one of the ALS events if when you're in Abuja, if and when you're in Abuja. So I think we'll take two last people. So I can see James Gordon. I don't know if you're able to speak. And then Ese, you just joined us. Ese, as a regular, it's really good to, <laughs> to hear from you. So James, are you there? We're just introducing ourselves and talking about our weeks. Okay, I'm not sure James is there, but what about Essie? Hmm. Essie as well seems to not be able to. Hi. 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 Good. Sorry, it's been a very busy day here. I don't know if you can see me, but let me hope you can. We can see you. <laughs> Hi. Are we just introducing ourselves? Ourselves, our weeks, like how was your week? And then what are you looking for? Okay. Hi, I'm Essie. Okay. Oh, okay. Yes, I'm Hi, everyone. I'm Essie. Hi, everyone. Day. I'm so happy to be here. The last time I saw you was, I think, at AK a very long time ago. So this is nice. I My week has been too tiring. Village people were after me this week. So that was very stressful. But I'm excited to celebrate Children's Day. And tomorrow, DK is having a show at Port Harcourt. So I'm definitely going to drop by that. So that's what I'm looking forward to the weekend. OK. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if it's my connection. Hello? But yeah, I can hear you, Essay. We heard we heard you. Yeah. I don't know if it was my connection or your connection, but I hope people can can hear me. Um yeah, so I mean it's good to have everyone here. We all know that we are the Abuja Literary Society. It's a safe space, it's a casual conversation. We're glad to have year one day, yes. <laughs> I was just confirming that you and then disappeared. <laughs> We're glad to have you one day here today. So you one day now would love to hear from you. So the way we set up this book jam is first of all, to hear about you, you know, because as you might have heard, a lot of the people here are writers or aspiring writers or creatives one way or the other. And we like to hear about the journeys of, of other creatives that have gone way ahead, you know, of us, you know, to see what we can learn. How did you start writing? Uh, was it when you were four years old, you know, when you were 14 years old uh, and where did it happen? And even something about you as a person, we have your bio. So the, the, your bio was sent to everyone as part of the newsletter, but then it would be good to hear in your own words because you're based in South Africa, you know, how did that happen? And what has it meant, you know, for your writing? You have books, um, The Woman Next Door, Bomboy. You know, what was the story around those books? So this is what we'll be starting with before we go into your book. So maybe we'll start with 
ye one day like you know who is ye one day <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, you can hear you. Oh, okay, great. Um, thanks so much. This is lovely. Yeah, this is um, what a lovely space to be invited into. Um, I just feel safe and intimate. So yeah, I'm, I'm honored. And um, thanks for everybody who's here. Um, and I get the sense that people come to the space, yeah, for the community. So anyway, just wanted to say thanks for that. Um, I'm based here in Johannesburg. Um, yeah, those are big questions. Let me think. Um, my mom was from the Caribbean and I was born in Barbados. And then my father, who's Nigerian, um, we then moved to Nigeria and I grew up in Ilefe, where I went to school. Um, and then in 1992, when I was about 12, we left Nigeria and came to South Africa. So that's how I happened to be in South Africa. My father's an academic and he came to teach at one of the universities in Cape Town and the family moved with him. Um, and we came to South Africa in 1992, which is, was a very interesting South Africa. It was a, a country um, that was still grappling with, you know, cutting from the painful and uh, oppressive history. Um, the elections, you know, the, the new dispensation had not been voted in yet. So it was an interesting time of transition, those couple of years that, that we came before um, the elections in 94. Um, so that's a little bit about me. I mean, what, uh, I guess I'm lucky to have grown up in a, in a house of books, and I grew up on the uh, campus of um, the Ilefe campus, which was also then renamed Obafemi Awolowo University campus. My dad was a lecturer there. My mother, um, my mother worked there, and I grew up around a lot of academics, but particularly a lot of writers, a lot of poets, playwrights, and so being creative and using and making up stories was a, a key part of my childhood and um, became a habit, I guess, that I took on. So creativity and reading and writing was always there. When did I sort of find a way to, for instance, write my first novel, Bomboy, which was published in 2011. Um, it was published in South Africa by Mojaji Books, um, which is, an, and I'll just mention some of these details because maybe these are publishers you may not have heard of, but that, um, Mojaji normally publishes women or people who identify as women and um, I think in mainly in Southern Africa, but there's no harm if, if you're sitting on a manuscript and you're looking for publishers to reach out to her. Um, her name is Colleen Higgs and the company is called, Moj uh, the publishing house is called Mojaji Books. Um, and the Bomboy was also published by Bookcraft in Nigeria, the Nigerian edition. And it was published in the States as well. Um, yeah, I've lost a lot of my brain cells since I had my kids. So the name of the publisher in the States escaped me. But if you want, um, and you can, you know, you're welcome to write to me also if there's stuff we don't get to today. You could, you know, I don't know, send me a, a, a tweet or something and I will, I, I will respond or on Facebook. I'm, I'm a bit slow on Facebook, but I do pop in every now and then. Um, so I'm just kind of speaking, if you want to help, uh, I was going to say, so that was my first novel. I studied architecture. Let me also say that. I'm an architect. I wanted to study, I wanted to write books, but, but my family kind of steered me towards architecture. I think we're all familiar with those kinds of parents and <laughs> sensible parents who say, mm, do something that can, you know, bring in the box. I mean, architecture, I don't know about box, but anyway. Um, I studied that and then I, I only, after many years working as an architect, went back and did a master's in creative writing. And Bob Boy was my thesis. And then when I finished writing the, the, the thesis, I, I submitted it to publishers. I do want to say, you don't need to, <laughs> you don't need to have a master's in creative writing. I hope you all know that to be able to write a novel or whatever, but that was just the pathway I chose. Um, mm -hmm. I, not, I just, I wanted a structure because I was working full-time and very, very busy with my architectural career, okay. I was doing this part-time. 
So I wanted a very clear structure that, and a supervisor that would guide me through the process of writing. But um, there are many ways. I mean, I was laughing. I had the opportunity to be at the French Literary Festival last weekend or a couple of weekends ago here in the Western Cape. And uh, Titi Dangaremba was on a panel that I was lucky enough to chair. And one of the things she said, you know, this is a woman who is so accomplished. She says, yeah, I think, you know, now I want to do, I want to go and do an MA in creative writing. And she was mm -hmm. saying, this is a good time to do it. Like I have, nothing can mess with my style. I can just learn, you know, I, I don't have to be swayed or influenced. I'm mature. Yeah. So I thought that was an interesting approach as opposed to this idea when you're green, go and do the MA. Mm -hmm. You know, she's doing the, the masters at a time when she's quite seasoned as a writer and is looking for new, new input and new guidance. So yeah, I, I'll pause there for now. I think I've said quite a bit. Yeah, I have a question on the architecture bits because, um... You know how art is very dynamic, right? So my my closest encounter with architecture was through this very controversial book uh, by Ayn Rand, uh, The Fountainhead. So it's about this guy that was this, you know, genius architect and how, I mean, his approach to architecture, oh, now they bring the light. <laughs> his approach to architecture was, um, it, it was almost like being an artist really because he was such a purist and he didn't want his work to be modified in any way to the point that, I mean, this is sort of like a spoiler, but I don't think many people are reading that book because it's sort of like a, a controversial book. Yeah, to the point that when his architecture was modified into the design of social housing, he went and burned down the houses because he didn't want any kind of alteration or modification to his art. So, you know, in, I mean, having a creative brain and, you know, as, as a writer and as an author and then working as an architect, did you ever experience um, any sort of, I don't know how to put it, sort of a connections between the two? Because some people, some architects can, can, can say that, you know, they tell stories with their, with their designs, right? Was that ever a thing for you? Yeah, yeah, that's a, uh, that's a great question and sure. Um, I mean, I think just to, to the Ayn Rand um, reference, I mean, I think, and I try to make fun of architects a little bit in The Woman Next Door, one of my characters happens to be an architect. I mean, I think architecture is a very a fascinating practice. It's, it's, a, it's a practice that's also about power. There's a lot of power an architect wields in terms of shaping space. Um, and so I do, I do think architects tend, or the, maybe not the worst kinds, but architects tend to be quite arrogant you know, quite and precious, maybe as the character you're describing is like, don't tamper with my work. And um, I, I don't feel as as precious as that, or as kind of, mm. it's so sacred. I mean, I think yeah. I think part of my creative practice is to allow for that I might be wrong, and that my my ideas as they emerge are are fallible, and that I I can be contributed to by others and by experiences and by insights that might not come you know straight from my straight from me so i think i think there's nothing wrong with a bit of humility in how we create in fact i think in many ways that saves my writing mm. is when i can have a, like my ego can just drop down a bit so that the work can flourish um those, those are my my beliefs um for sure i feel like i mean i love i mean there's so many things arundhati roy studied architecture I just wanted to say, I don't practice as an architect anymore. I practice for a while, but at the moment, I don't run a practice. And I don't practice informally, at least, let me say. Arundhati Roy studied architecture, and I, I, there's so many things she says that I admire. I mean, that alone gives me a sense of kinship. But she also talks a lot about how, for her, writing books is how she practices architecture. And a lot of her architecture is very spatial. Um, and I know that when I write, you know, I, I do sort of, I'm trained spatially and I'm trained, you know, in, in terms of how we occupy space. So I do believe that comes through, or I hope. Um, I think, I think, I think you, you can structure a book, you kind of build, and particularly a novel, there's something you really do build, like you, 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 you have, you found it, you know, you have foundation to it, you have the pillars, you, you, you hold it, you, you shape it. Um, in, in the same way, metaphorically, that, that one, you know, builds a building. So I think there are a lot of comparisons. Um, I feel 
I mean, I struggled through architecture. I mean, I, in the end, I love architecture, but I struggled through the education. Now, many years on, I'm really grateful for that education. And I feel as if yeah. it helps me write the kind of novels that I want to write and that I end up writing. Mm, that's super interesting. I didn't, I don't think I knew that about Arundhati Roy. I mean, The God of Small Things is, is um, a book that I love a lot. So it's good to know. I also did not know that you could write a novel as your thesis for an MFA, which is pretty cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, well, yeah, for the, for the, uh, at least, okay, I did mine at the University of Cape Town. Um, and that, that MFA, they call it an MA, all you submit is your work, yeah. right? You submit your work. So they, they, the requirement might be a 60,000 word, you know, document, or if it's poetry, it's something else, or it's short stories. Um, and <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, I know that at the University of Joba, at, at Wits University, it's similar. So you can submit your novel and then there's an element that is also theoretical. Mm. Um, I, mm. I did some supervision for you, for Wits. They have an excellent program, by the way, that I really recommend. Uh, Grahamstown also has an MA program. So it's it's not that uncommon, uh, um, Lasa. So I'm not sure, it's not that uncommon to, to submit your your creative work as yeah. part of your your thesis yeah Jesus. yeah i think it's it's more of my ignorance you know because i i work in the policy space and so perhaps i didn't i don't know as much about it as i ought to but then um i mean now you you mentioned some of your earlier novels so bomboy was the first and then you had the woman next door isn't it but where do the ideas yes. these novels come from like or where do you usually get your inspiration for your novels and if you can walk us a bit through the process because I reckon that the process you probably followed for Bomboy, since it was in an academic environment, might have been different from the woman next door. So, what does that look like for you? Yeah, I mean, to be to be honest, the process the process isn't necessarily different. Um, hopefully, as time passes and I write more books, I I have a bit more facility with my. With how I with how I work and I understand my process, but the process for me is quite messy, and it was very messy, even though it was in an academic space, um, which is I enjoyed that because you're kind of left alone. You have a supervisor, but you're left alone to find your voice and find your what you're doing. Um, and I feel like I was allowed to do that, and it made a difference for me. Um, what what isn't inspiring? I mean, I think if if you're if you're if you're writing and you're in the world and your eyes are open. There's so much. There's there's so much that we can that we can tell and that we can explore. Um, I feel like mostly what I have to do is 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 decide what not to write about, then to decide what to write about because there's there's so much that kind of wakes me up. And, it, and ultimately, I think I'm very compelled, like many writers, by family, the unit of a family, and the complexity of family. I'm I've written a lot about mothers and motherhood. Um, I've written, I write in some way about death or loss. Um, I'm interested in repair. I'm interested in how we break and how we can mend. So those are some common themes, I would say, or threads through the stories I write. Um, I'm working now on a slightly more biographical piece, specifically a, more about around myself, my, my mother and my grandmother, but also my kids and, and, and how I came to motherhood and what family means and different ways that families become. And I mean, I'm quite excited to dive into that in, in just a bit. But there was something you said just now, you said, you know, it's, it's almost as if it's more about trying not to write about everything you know, because there's so much to write about. And I think it's a challenge that a lot of writers face. So really that discipline of starting a story and then going through with it and finishing it instead of having a new idea and starting that one. And then you have like 10, you know, projects that have gone midway. So in terms of writing discipline, what has been your approach to it so far? You know, it would be, it would be nice to hear yeah. about, about that. Yeah, I mean, that that's great. And I, I you touch on something that I think is important. I mean, restraint. Restraint is something I think is very important as a creative person, um, knowing what to cut out. 
Um, I, um, my, but yeah, I, I think, I mean, you have to write firstly, you know, cause sometimes you think about writing, you talk about writing, you want to write, you try to write. I mean, you actually just have to write if you're going to write. And I remember, it seems like such a small thing, but I remember having to get that when I was working on Bomboy because I didn't have time and I'm working and I didn't have time. And a friend of mine was like, you know, with like, are you writing now? Okay, okay, so you're not writing now. Are you writing now? You know, and, and I realized you actually just have to write. You just have to put one word after the other. Um, my process, I don't, I don't feel compelled to write perfectly. Um, I, like, I don't know if you've heard that thing where they said that bashers and swoopers, like bashers, write in a way where they have to get it right and the words have to be right and they they write 10 words and delete eight and write another 10 and delete 12 and write another 10 and delete and they're bashing through the manuscript and then swoopers kind of have a bit of a lighter touch and swoop in and you know write 100 words and swoop and write another 100 and they're probably the wrong 100 but they just write and write and collect and I write that way so I would just work up my manuscript to about 50,000 words or 40,000 words and that could be over quite a long time De just dedicated just writing 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 telling the story checking a few things but not reading back and editing and like being pedantic and then later coming back and you know with an editing hat on looking and seeing how to edit and so my process is writing lots and lots of drafts basically and each time shaping the draft shaping the draft until the final product um it seems like I, I take quite long. So if I think of each novel, there are about five years that separate each one. Um, so, I mean, maybe the first one wasn't quite five years because it was in the it was in the MA, mm -hmm. but it, it was about five. And then The Woman Next Door came out in 2016 and Unusual Grief just came out now. So that's a kind of a, it doesn't mean I'm writing for five years. I'm also sometimes doing other things, working, mm -hmm. you know, traveling, but um that seems to be the sweet spot for me and in that time I can work my drafts I can do my research and mm -hmm. come up with the pro product that I want yeah yeah and I mean I I completely get that because it's sort of like the process that you uh that you require to cook <laughs> if you use the the word cook you know to cook uh, your stories because you can't force a story out of you and sometimes it comes to you in big pieces. But then this thing that you mentioned, the bashers and the supers, the supers, this is the first time I'm hearing it and it sounds um really interesting. I think it's probably something that a lot of writers struggle with and we should probably be trying to be supers than, you know, bashers. We should be aiming more for the swooping um, approach than the yeah. approach because, you know, I, I think I read well, it somewhere. Go ahead. And I was just going to say that I read a quote somewhere that writing is about sitting in front of a computer or a typewriter or a book and bleeding. So if you're bleeding, I mean, <laughs> inherent in the idea of bleeding, you cannot rush bleeding, isn't it? You don't have any control over it. It will be according to, you know, your heart beats more or less. So, yeah, you're going to say yeah. something. I mean, I, I, I was going to say that, that I do think at the very least bashing like swooping is probably better for our mental health than bashing you know of course neither one is is right or wrong and they both come out with the product and i know people who are incredibly perfectionist and that's just how they work and also you sometimes can't change how you work right it's just yeah. this is how i work mm -hmm. but um i feel a bit lucky that that i i, I can have a lighter expectation of of the of the of the writing and i can trust that through a process it it will come right but it it doesn't have to come out correct it can just come out in its rough trying to find itself form and then i will shape that over time and it, just to say i think it was kurt vonnegut that has that bashes and supers um, um okay. analogy okay. yeah another writer that i that i really like i mean yeah. it seems yeah. like we like very similar writers <laughs> So it's good to hear that. It's really good to hear that. I'm reminding everyone again, this is the Abuja Literary Society Book Jam. So we have you on the Omoto show. Um, from now, you can start to think about your questions. You can type them in the chat or, you know, it's an interactive session. I'm not the only one that's going to talk. You know, everyone, I'm a very quiet person, a very gentle person. <laughs> so everyone is going to, is going to say something. 
So now, you know, uh, your book, An Unusual Grief, because you just said that you like to dive into themes around motherhood, around loss, around uh, grief. And um, I mean, these are themes that I personally have a lot of interest in as well, because I think that they are one of the most complex things to try to write about. So really getting into the nitty gritty of human relationships and just human beings as we are. Because my undergrad was in psychology and in psychology, they say that um, the human brain is the only thing that tries to study itself, you know. So we, we, for many of the things that we do, we are not entirely sure why we did those things. I may behave, I may say something today, say something else tomorrow. And I may not even realize it was because there was a slight change in the temperature around me that, you know, triggered a change in my behavior. So it's just so complex, but it's always so beautiful when writers try to unpack you know, um, human behavior. So this thing on mothers, right? Would you say that you started to write around those themes um, after you became a mother? Where would you say this came from really? Yeah, that's firstly, that's really interesting. And that's a wonderful degree to have as a writer. I think I'm quite jealous. I mean, I think historians, psychologists, medical doctors, because I'm always asking my doctor friends, well, what's that disease and what, and lawyers. These are wonderful professions when it comes to, to telling stories because of the kind of knowledge you you gain. Um, absolutely, that that is um, yeah. I think psychological. I think the idea of our, our, our psychology and our, our like um, what are what are our pathologies? You know, why, why are we the way we are? That's something that fascinates me, which is why I, I I'm particularly enter story through character. And my preoccupation in storytelling is with character. Of course, there's setting and theme and so on. But I, I think char character is quite central to me and character building. Um, so no, I mean, my kids are small. They, I have twin boys and they're 20, 22 months. So, so definitely not I'm becoming a mother because I'm very recently a mother and I've been writing for longer than that. Um, but certainly becoming a mother has um, put an interesting spin on, on that obsession with mothers and motherhood I mean I think it's just you know why, why are we the way we are I need to you're the psychologist right why is it why is this what is I'm obsessed with I mean I think I, I lost my mom when I was um, in my early 20s uh, my mom uh, uh, died of um, cancer and I think something like that is you know I think maybe between that and having kids are the two things that have probably influenced my life the most um influence sort of yeah my how I think and how I how I experience um life so in some ways that that might be part of it that that um that kind of shaped and at, at 23 I was um by 23 I, I I was um I knew I wanted to write you know I was studying architecture still but I knew I wanted to write so it was also a time when some of my creative leanings were kind of germinating I guess as a young adult so maybe that set me off you know with that obsession but but I also think we all come from some kind of family um broken and whole you know um toxic and and wholesome uh or sometimes a combination of somewhere in between um and so it's, I'm, I think it, it's common, and I did say that for many writers, that is a, a recurring um, point in the writing, the, the, the exploration of family, this, this unit of family. What does it mean? Why is it important? When it works, why does it work? When it doesn't work, how come? Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, motherhood is, is such, I don't know. I feel like it's one of the most complicated things in the world. And I mean, aside having a mother, I have a mother, I have a great mother. I think my one of my uh, earliest introductions to the complexity of motherhood was um, The Joys of Motherhood, you know, the book by... Yes. Yeah. Which and she? Exactly. Which mm -hmm. And I was really young when I read the book, maybe 11 or 12. But I'm realizing that that book had uh, a big impression on me and even my own perception of motherhood. So for the longest time, um, even as an adult, or let's say as a teenager and as an adult, when I would see a woman, so maybe like a woman that looked youngish and looked, you know, fly and, you know, she looked like she was really great killing it. And then if I'd now see that she had children, I'd feel sorry for her. <laughs> 
for some reason, like, I wow. feel sorry for her, like, oh, what a, uh, you know, wow, you know, she's not free. And I began, when I started to try to analyze why that was my response to, you know, to motherhood as a burden, I've tried to trace it back to perhaps that book that was one of my earliest introductions to motherhood. So it's interesting how, you know, some things just, you know, shape you in ways that, that you don't expect. And now with yeah. this particular book, you know, An Unusual Grief, it's about the relationship between a mother and her daughter. And I mean, the <laughs> on Twitter not too long ago, someone put a thread, a, a, a tweet that went viral and about how, that she, and she asked this question she said why is it that the relationship between mothers and their first daughters are always so weird that it's almost as if um their mothers are competing with them and then everyone under the tweet was saying yes it's true i thought it was just me my mother is my mother is that and all of these women of course love their mothers but then they were saying some things um that I was linking to some of the other rhetoric that is out there. So, you know, in this modern feminism, there is a statement that goes something like, we are not our mothers. I don't, I can't remember exactly how it goes. Um, if someone in the, in the, in, in the audience knows, you know, that statement, something like we are not our mothers. And, you know, they're trying to use it to say that, um, uh, like this generation of feminists would not um, suffer the same way our mothers in quotes, um, suffered because there's this idea that oh, uh, um, the, uh, the older generation were more willing to accept some injustices and just move on. So I think there's a link there because what these women were saying on that thread was that um, they felt like their mothers were jealous of the choices that they were able to make mm. you know, versus the ones that they thought was available to them in the past. Mm. Um, and this is some, I mean, this is something that is probably a lot more complicated than even they think about it. So for example, I was telling my mother that after I get married, I'm not going to change my last name. And, you know, she was a little bit surprised and saying, oh, what about this? What about that? And I said, what about nothing? It's about, <laughs> it's about me. And this is what I think your book really dives into some of um, these complexities, right? So, and I think maybe the question I'm trying to ask now is, I mean, you already said that you get the, the inspiration for your stories from just around there, but then how were you really able to unpack that very complex relationship in the ways that you did, you know? Mm -hmm. And was there, I mean, the, was there a message that you were trying to send across as well? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, quite a, there's a lot there. Um, I okay, so I, as I said, I always come at, at, at the stories through character. So I'm not necessarily coming, I don't even, of course, I know it's going to be a mother and daughter in relationships, but I don't write from theme, like, okay, I'm writing a theme about mother and daughter. Um, I find a person, like, an, a, as real and as palpable for me as possible. And I start engaging this person and working out who they are, where they've been, what happened what's happening now and what can happen for them in the future. Where are they stuck? Um, where have they lost? You know, where, what are they struggling with? And so that's how I started writing about Mujisala is the main character of the story. She's the mother. Her daughter Yinka has taken her life and they were estranged at the time of the death. So she's grieving, but she's also in the dark, she really doesn't know her child. And she obviously cannot answer that question that all parents who have to confront something as horrific as this have. Why, you know, why would she do that? What was happening in her life? Was it my fault, of course, is, is a question that, that, that Mojisola has. So that's that's it. Every Everything I write is a project and an experiment. So it's I don't have the answers when I start. I don't know where I'm going and I don't know what the outcome will be. But it's like, okay, if we take this person with these circumstances and this backstory and this situation and we just walk with her, just walk with her. Um, I, I free write a lot. I don't pre-plan my books. I don't set out the chapters way ahead. I don't do anything like that. So I really don't know what's going to happen. Um, I find like if I, if I plan the book, I mean, each to their own, because everyone again has their own way of working. But when I plan the book, I find I lose something, you know, um, something is lost, some kind of sense of mystery and discovery. I don't want to know how it ends until I get there. Um, you know, there's something, yeah, it's one of those weird things. I tried planning because I think that's much easier than how I work. And also 
because of the way I work, sometimes I go down the wrong road, you know, because I'm saying, oh, okay, this is what it is. And I write, you know, tens of pages. And then I have to delete those pages because it's like, mm, that hasn't worked out. But I would rather that than the very meticulous pre-planning because I, I think creativity needs to be dynamic and you have to be able to shift and change if, if your idea, your precious idea, again, back to this idea of, you know, my precious idea isn't working. If it's not working though, if your design is bad or wrong, how do you fix that? And you have to have a, a, a fairly flexible ego to be able to say, okay, maybe that's not quite the right, right thing to do. Let me shift. Let me look again. Let me try again. Let me get input. Let me take some time off and bring new eyes. You know, that's also part of being creative. So, so yeah, that's how I explored it. I just wanted to write about this woman who, whose daughter dies mm. and like, what's that like? So, and, and then I start to create the story. You know, I decided that she would move into her daughter's apartment in a, in a different town and she would start to go through her things, her computer, her cell, her te- her cell phone, her cupboards, really playing detective and then she of course she finds things so what does she find and what does that mean and what does that tell her and and from there I write you know so that's that's kind of how I wanted to explore it but always through character always always through a person's experience yeah and um so I have a question on that so first of all you know the idea of writing from characters I think it's very interesting I remember that it's similar to what's um, uh, uh, the, the unbearable lightness of, of being Milan Kundera, yes. He insists that the entire idea for the novel came from his vision of a man standing by a window. And he literally built a novel out of just that image in his mind. And the question I have is this, you know, because it sounds like you you have a character in your mind and you let them sort of like tell the story isn't it so to what extent would you say that your characters have a power over you versus you having a power over your characters and even as it relates to um so for example as it relates to because when a, a character is going through a particular emotional states you know to what extent does are you an observer of that so to what extent are you right in that emotional state with the character Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I really believe, and I feel like that's the kind of process I have in my writing, that the story exists. The story exists as an entity distinct from me. Um, The characters are there, living their lives, propelling, you know, propelled along whatever, um, whatever route that they're propelled along. And as a creative person, I have the opportunity to tap into, tap into that to find it, to discover it. So the writing is a discovery of something that is already. So so Mojisola is there and I'm trying to find out what her story is. So your question is really apt about this thing of power. Like I don't feel I, you know, can, you know, force Mojisola into something. I think when the writing, at least for me, is bad on the page, it's usually because I'm trying to make her do something versus realize that she is something or that she's doing something um and so it is an interesting process of writing where i feel like i'm constantly engaging with the characters and the content the creative work that is out there i mean um the, i really loved the, the story i don't know how true it is but it's 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 maybe become legend but like michelangelo i believe it was had this approach to sculpting where he believed that the sculpture, like if he has this big block of stone, right? The sculpture, of course, is inside that. Of course it is. And what he does is he chips away everything that isn't the sculpture until what's left is the piece that he's making. And I, I love that for myself. Of course, you know, I want to liken myself to Michelangelo. But I mean, I love the <laughs> yeah, lofty ambitions there. But I mean, I love the, I just love this idea, this image of that the thing is there. And my job is actually to take away what isn't, to find it. And my skill as a writer is in that finding. Um, And that helps ego as well. Like I'm not some fantastical person making stuff up. You know, I'm I'm discovering something that is actually there. And my, my, my skill is in finding that and having the humility to find it and to check like, is this, 
this is the case in writing this book. I mean, um, unusual grief takes a, a rather funny turn in that Mojisola also has quite a sexual awakening in her grief. And um, portions of the book explore um, BDSM and, and, and fetish lifestyle because that was what her daughter was engaged in. And um, part of me as a writer with my conceit wanted to maybe go you know, full throttle with that and have quite a lot of explosive you know, uh, BDSM performance on the pages. And like Mojisala sort of said, dial it down, you know, like dial that down a bit, um, temper that, it, it can't, this isn't that book. You know, and I had to realize that. I thought, I think I was trying to sell my book a bit better because I thought sex sells. But, but I realized that this isn't that story. So it's how to be true to the story, how to be, how to honor the characters, how to honor the piece of work um, that, that is its own spirit distinct from mine. And like, I, I'm in conversation with it and I can have respect for it. Um, it's not about my will as a creative person. Um, so I love that kind of way of approaching my work. That's, it might sound weird to some and it's not everybody's cup of tea. But that helps me, I feel, write the best books that I can produce. Mm -hmm. So now the question of, um, so yeah, you, you, I, I mean, I hear that. But then in terms of, you know how some people say writing is catharsis, right? So, and now we're getting into the issues around mental health, because mental health was also something that you explored in the book. But even starting from the writer, you know, and writing um, a book that has such heavy themes, I mean, to some extent, would you say that you were you so were you were you an observer for the story? So were you an observer and then you sort of like midwife to the story unfolding? Or would you say you were in there? So were you going through the highs and lows with the characters, you know, even as a writer? And did that have any um af, af effect yeah have any effect on your own mental state even while you are writing the stories yeah probably not while i'm writing maybe a little sometimes if i read back like if i read portions of the book now i might i might be moved by something or taken by something um there, there is activity on my part i am you know I, i'm i'm obviously writing it and i'm i'm, I'm adding my own ideas and I'm Im imaging stuff and I'm, I'm bringing things in. So it, it's, it's an interactive process. Um, I mean, some writers say, oh, I'm taking notation. I don't feel like I'm taking notation, like some God is whispering to me all the words, like it does feel like work and I'm having to, you know, use, but, um, but it is, I guess all I'm saying is it, I'm, I'm, I'm interacting with something distinct from myself. Um, and and yeah, and it is it is intense. And I do it it's also I never know where I'm going. Like, where am I going with this text? Is it gonna turn out? Are we gonna reach a place that works? Are we gonna have a book in the end? Um I never know. And 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 that's an interesting element that's apparently necessary for my process, like the not knowing versus the knowing. But I think it actually even makes it more interesting for you because it's it's almost like you're taking yourself on a journey as well. So, and it can be quite exciting, you know, not knowing yeah. where it's going to end up, but then just knowing that it's going to end up somewhere at some point and then you go with it. Um, but I'd like to talk a little bit more about mental health because um, at the Abuja Literary Society, it's, I, I think this month is Mental Health Awareness Month, if I'm correct. Yes, uh, I think it is. And uh, I mean, we had some events around that as well. And generally in Nigeria, and I guess in much of Africa, there's a little bit of a, I can't even call it a renaissance because it's not like a rebirth of something, but there's a little bit of a growing movement as far as mental health goes and just um, personal well-being and, and wellness. And um, there's some initiatives, you know, around us just trying to support people in terms of their mental health. And one question that we ask ourselves uh, sometimes here is, you know, what is really the role of the, so there is two things, right? So number one, we know that creatives often, um, by virtue of some of the ways, uh, by virtue of the way they think and the way that they, that they approach their work sometimes, some, some of them are more vulnerable to, um, I don't want to say mental health issues, but just to um, emotional extremes, perhaps. And then also there's the other side of, you know, what could be the role of the creative, you know, as far as 
managing um mental health okay i saw that you have to you switch off your video that's that's perfectly fine so what is the role of a creative or the writer in, in terms of trying to even you know uh walk people through some of their mental health issues because um yeah because people often turn to arts or they turn to books to to pick them out of certain moods or to even find empathy in in what they're feeling because one thing that we're sure of in this world is that whatever it is you're feeling at any given moment someone else has felt exactly that same way it's almost um definite so do you have any reflections on that really like you know so first of all artists and their mental health and then the role of art and artists in the general uh well-being or wellness of mental health of um, our populations of our societies yeah yeah i mean um wow well, i think there's a lot there i mean firstly i guess the easier question is 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 around the role of creative work i mean art and art in its widest definitions you know dance uh, visual art film um theater of course poetry, book, song. I mean, so just creative work and creative endeavor um, is, I mean, there are many, there are many famous uh, sayings, whether like artists are the, the conscience of the society, they are the compass of the society, they are the, you know, pick your word. So I think, I think there's no doubt for me that, that, um, this plays a huge role, but you had asked something earlier about message and maybe I'll link the two. I mean, I personally don't write to deliver message because I think when you have that mission, it could add a, a, a weight to the text that can sometimes kill it. You know, uh, um, you know sometimes you read something and it's just, you just feel like, someone's bashing you on the head with their message whereas 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 think think of think of the lightest poem you've read and you you and it moves you and touches you and it, it improves your day um you know that that per, you, you can never plan for that right that's just somebody doing their job doing the poem well and if you do the poem well if, if you write the book well that story that piece then 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 forget message you know it's 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 it does so much more than message. Um, so, so I think I, I really believe in the power of, of creative work. And that's, that's not something I'm doing. That's not a me doing that. That's just, that's the magic of creative work. So if I do that piece of work properly, it then does its job, which is it touches who it needs to touch and it messages who it needs to message with and what the heck message they need to hear, who knows? versus me prescribing of the message today has to be. So, so that's kind of my approach to message and, and the ideas around the power of creative work. I mean, I think the other question is interesting. I mean, often creative people, there, there are many versions of that, right? You, we've had drunks, addicts, you know, people have taken their lives, people have, so, so why is that? Um, I think that's more interesting. Why, why is, you know, we're, we're not necessarily the wellest people, you know, because we do creative work and maybe, the reason is because we're burdened by that labor and, and by what it means to like really go deep and do that kind of labor. And often the people who do that labor, we've been broken in different ways. We've, we, we also, we see, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, it's very hard to keep looking, right? It's much easier to numb. It's much easier to business as usual. If you're a creative person, you have, the way you do your work is you look, you look really, really hard and you ask questions and you look again and you keep looking when you, you, you know, you're crying, you're looking so hard, but you don't look away. And of course there is a, um, there's a, there's a fallout to that kind of uh, looking. Um, I don't know about you, but in, as I became an adult, you know, I, I explored therapy. I've explored all kinds of things to, um, to take care of myself and my mental health and um, to be aware that the kind of work I want to do takes me into dark places. So I have to have a way to take care of myself in those dark places or when I come out of them. Um, and I think part of the reason we um, participate 
in a activity, creative work, with you know obviously millions and billions of people around the world, and but but that that group of people suffer so much, you know, suicide, drugs, drunk, um, alcoholism, terrible relationships, you know, can't you know it's all the dysfunction is maybe because yeah that the 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 weight of that kind of labor, and I know I know. Um, Elizabeth Gilbert has that really popular TED talk where she sort of has a whole approach to that because she thinks it's also about ego. Um, if you haven't seen that, yeah, I find that what she says interesting, so I recommend that. I think I'm going to look for that, actually. And um, yeah, it's um, I think it's something that we even spoke about in January, so the, the session we had in January, and really why it just seemed like you know, creatives were even more predisposed to, um, or maybe they're just a lot more sensitive to things that are going on around them, you know, so I, maybe I can put it that way. And just how, you know, they could try to handle that in ways that everyone, um, I mean, in ways that would improve their, their well being, really. Mm -hmm. But now, Yohan, did you have your book with you? Because, you know, we'd like to hear you know, some excerpts. So maybe this is a point when we can, <laughs> this is a point when we can hear the first uh, excerpt, if you're open to that. You know, to really yeah, sure. Love it. What, what I do do, just quickly before I forget, I hope she's still here. Uh, who was it? Oh, goodness me. Somebody had a question about publishing. Oh, she may have gone. Anyway, someone wrote to me directly and said, why Cassava Republic? So I just wanted to answer that before I forget. Okay. Cassava Republic published this book. I mean, I wrote the book. This is my third novel. I have an agent. Her name is, um, I'll just put her name here for anybody who's, yeah, I don't know what sort of questions people have, how, like how, right. but I'll just share all, yeah, all this stuff. Chats, you know. Yeah, it still works. <laughs> she has an agency and she represents me. And when I finished the novel, we finished the manuscript and she we started submitting it. Um, and Cassava Republic and one of the publisher are the ones who came back to us. <laughs> so so when someone says why Cassava Republic, I mean sometimes sometimes it's only the one publisher that comes back. In my case, I I had fine, I had two, which is lovely. It's better than a kick in the teeth, but in <laughs> Yeah. You don't always have a, an endless amount of uh, choices uh, around that. I do need to add, um, yeah, I'm, I'm happily published. The book is here. I'm thankful for, you know, that the, that the book could come out um, with a publisher, with a Nigerian publisher that feels meaningful to me, with a woman publisher that also feels meaningful to me, uh, Bibi Bakari. And... Um, yeah, so that I, I hope that uh, I think that's kind of what they were asking, and they may have gone. She may have gone actually. There's a hand, and maybe we take that hand because I didn't pick something. Specific. Yeah. So um, we take that okay. while I look. So yes, while you look, we can have Davidson. Davidson, is it a question or a comment? But then the mic is over to you. Okay. Good evening. Um, I at first it's not. This is not a, not a question, it's a comment. For a fact, we have very few writers who would think the way this is here on this book. They think it's very, very wide, and Joy of Mother World, uh, Degree, everything all put together, it's, it's just perfect. But, you know, I just, what I enjoy in this piece, because I have not read it, and I'm looking forward to read the book, the brief summary given about the book. It's it gives me the idea that you're not just you're not just telling the story according to what you said concerning the characters. The characters, nothing is over and the person, not the character, over the author with also over the character. It's just going according to the, the way I see this book is it's something people should benefit from. And also your your writing strategy is also very good. I know you're talking about five years. Uh, Although you're talking about a little bit of ideas, okay. we have we are lots of writers. Personally, been a writer. All right, today the leave it because something else comes up, and we all know every writer knows that you don't just write because you want to maybe finish a print a publication and less than two weeks and boom the truth. So the time you take and you think it is, is actually what it is. You know, looking at the fact. You're looking at um, the perspective you're from your, I think, your nationality, ambassador, and 
Nigeria, South Africa, whatever team to get her on the birth of just one team to compete. Uh, you know, there's so many authors that there was no head from I personally don't head about. And this video was I mean it was just like it brings so many authors and writers together and it actually makes me think, wow, if we have these authors and writers all over the world, what have you to say change the world? Although it's very slow, I know every good thing has a very slow process to change in. But what I do want to say now is if it is look at the art, it's not just mind blowing. Like David, things. David, if I, you don't mind uh, adjusting your mic a bit, there's something muffled about your sound. Are you using okay. earphones? Uh, yeah. Maybe the earphones. Um, maybe you can use your your mic directly. Can you hear me now? Yeah, it's much better. Yeah. Okay, so I, I said concerning, I, you know, she said something about Michelangelo being a legend and he's writing. You know. Everybody has their own theme and ways and strategies and writing. But like Mrs. Here on the Hair, it doesn't matter how long you take. It just matters the effort you put in. Then Mrs. Here on the, if you don't mind me asking a very important question. While you were writing this book, I don't know. You know, we have lots of people. Some people write in write a book. And from that book they've written, they get another book. And the list goes on. Like you said, a bird, a person standing from a window. and boom, a book is published. I don't know if I, if I may ask you this question. While you were writing this book, what was your prospect? Were you, when you wrote the book or in the middle of the book, when you finished the book, did you have in mind that in this book or a part of this book, maybe you must have missed that you want to add it in your, maybe your next book or something like that? Did you? Yeah, I mean, so thanks. Sorry, the sound isn't great, but, but thanks a lot for your comments. I picked up a few things. Um, yeah, I mean, what, it's such a funny thing you say, because I, the way I write, I do delete a lot, you know, like I, with this book in particular, there was a time I sort of had to delete like 20,000 words or something, which of course is incredibly painful to do. Um, and often I, the characters I develop that just never make it to the book, the final book. So I do tell a joke that, you know, one day I'll just write one book with all the lost characters that I deleted and put them in a story together. Um, I mean, I don't know if I'll ever do that, but but so so in some ways, your question about yeah was is do I think okay I'll I'll do something like that in another book, sure, but in a sort of a jokey way. Um, I think often there's many stories competing. Like I, I'm writing two things at the moment. One is slightly more biographical, and one is slightly more fantastical. I think there's you know there one is there there's so many competing ideas and you have to you almost have to decide okay what am I going to uh, pay attention to and spend time on time is limited so what am I going to spend time on okay thank you very that, much that you actually question. read my mind and you know we have we have so many others who think like that you just have to pick one particular story but nonetheless I really really appreciate your work and for a fact if there's anybody who has lent anything from here today, it definitely it's me. I really appreciate your work. And I I am most grateful that you're you're here to, you know, talk about the book with us today. Thank you and good evening. Thank you, David. Thanks a lot. Okay, so you didn't say how long I should read for. I mean, I'll read uh, if I if I read that much. Um yeah, I mean Less. Sort of like a, if it's sort of like, how do you put it? It's something that has some sort of shape to it, isn't it? Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it has some shape, I think. Who knows? We'll find out. Okay. So, um, let me see. Yeah. As she drives to the venue, Mojisola cannot shake the feeling once again of being a, in a crime movie. Except now she knows she is both criminal and detective. Perhaps she is even the victim, but no, she thinks, pulling up at the venue, Yinka is the victim. After all, it is always the victim, always, in all the movies, an inviolable rule who is dead. It is a Thursday. Mojisola is relieved that at least by one day they have avoided the weighted meaning implicit in Friday night meetings. 
because although d man has referred to this appointment as a date she has told herself over and over again that it is just a meeting regardless of what fantasies he has brewed up fantasies that will surely disappear when he sees her no doubt she could be his mother for her this is about the drawings the drawings the drawings she debated whether to reveal herself as a bereaved mother perhaps rely on his sympathy but the reality is she does not know the man he might have no sympathy to speak of her daughter may have taken a liking to him she can't tell for sure but she mujisala is discerning this modern way of courting online while amusing is really absurd so when she sees him from a distance standing nervous at the entrance lit by ocean baskets blue neon she must remind herself that really he is a stranger she cannot trust him yet he has in his possession the most precious thing basically he is dangerous d man she feels stupid for not having asked his real name hot with embarrassment she reaches her hand out fast before he can say fire babe and offers herself amienka jide he says smiling easily taking her hand in his in his other hand are the flowers there are five yellow heads the plastic wrapping arranged around their long green stalks she doesn't even have to check whether his shoes are suede so good to finally meet you he has surprised her his height the fact that he is bald as promised but he also wears a not too close beard his eyes are sharp and he shakes hands as if he wants to pull her somewhere together he a second behind they walk into the restaurant the suggestion was hers once again to head off any romantic notions but as they sit down she sees her naivety jide is looking at her in a way that translates across time zones languages and generations the downness of a chain restaurant will not dampen his ardor you're beautiful he says straight away before any waiter has even had a chance to hand them menus oh look i no none of this shy shy business i beg he turns to the waiter and orders something she doesn't quite catch busy as she is catching herself what's up there okay <laughs> would you mind walking us through what was happening just yeah, so the, the story the story has Mojisala go to her daughter's apartment and go through her things and she climbs into her laptop and discovers that her daughter uh had had an online dating profile at least that's what it appears to be to the mother Mojisala is 60 and and Yinka has taken her life at the she's about 23 when she does this so that's one of the that's kind of the premise of the novel that she discovers this and in her search to understand what was going on with her daughter she goes through the messages of course that were shared on the dating platform and um, she discovers that Yinka had a particular co correspondence with somebody called D-Man she called herself Firebabe on the on the platform and he called himself D-Man and they had these long chats and um Mojisola kind of reads through the chats and she she even um she even reaches out to the guy you know wondering whether maybe he's somebody that might have answers for her but in some ways she's also impersonating her child she steps into her daughter's shoes she wears her clothes and she sets up this date with D-Man and pretends she's Yinka basically she hasn't told him he doesn't seem to know that Yinka is dead and she hasn't told him and she doesn't tell him that she's the mom so she impersonates her she impersonates firebabe because he's never met firebabe and she goes and meets d man and so the, in this scene is the first time they meet and a, a huge part of the plot and the story develops from there this relationship that she develops with d man uh, for people who will read it i don't want to spoil it but yeah. but yeah that's a key part of so, I mean, in some ways, I think that Mujisala goes into grief, but she actually ends up discovering herself. She's a particularly repressed woman. She has a particularly unhappy marriage. Her husband has been unfaithful. Um, so she has to untangle herself and the grief allows her to. That's kind of the unusual part 
is that it becomes in, in many ways a, like a sexual exploration and an exploration of her desire. Mm. There's something there. So on the same issue of mothers and, and daughters, well, first of all, it's interesting that Demon would have been equally open to a 23 year old and a 60 year old, which, <laughs> yeah. which is yeah, yeah. interesting. Yeah, oh. just sorry, just to just to add to say, so 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 what happens on the chat is they hadn't ex exchanged any photographs, and um, you know, Mojisola knows that when he sees her, he will realize she's not twenty three, and she assumes that that would kill all possibility. But when he sees her, he thinks she just lied about her age, um, and that she was shy. And he finds that he he finds all the women attractive, you know, and and so they they proceed with their with their unusual experience. Let's call it. I would quite call it romance, but I'll call it experience. So now I have two questions or two things to say. The first one is, you know how they sometimes say that mothers, like one of the reasons why mothers sometimes put pressure on their daughters is because, and generally parents and children, right? Parents usually feel like, oh, they've lived particular kinds of lives and then they want their children to live a better life. So they try to use, sometimes to use their children to fix the mistakes that they made, or they try to make sure that their children do not make the same mistakes and they just want their children to learn from their own experiences. But it, it seems like it's almost flipped in this case because this is a woman that has lived, I mean, a life. She's 60 years old. She's done a lot of the things that you're supposed to do in life. And then now sort of like um, changing paths based on her daughter's life. So instead of it being, you know, from like the, the mother trying so hard, to, I mean, I'm sure, you know, that happened at the moment initially, which was maybe what also led to the fight between them. But then it's like her, um, it's almost like she's, learning to live from her daughter instead of you know the way it typically goes where um the mother uh i mean you know the, the way it typically goes right you know, with parents and children yeah. yeah that was the first thing i wanted to say and then the other thing i would like to also hear your thoughts on is um you know i mean i think essie and i was it essie and i and we were in a webinar somewhere and we're having this debate that um when it comes to sexual experiences, right, and um, especially ones that center women, that it's always easy to tell when it's written by a man versus when it's written by a woman. And I still hold that belief very strongly that I can tell when a, a sexual en encounter um, from a woman's perspective is written by a man because the way they uh, the way it's approached is usually different versus when it's written by a woman. So it'd be good to hear what you think about about these two things. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I, yes, in terms of the first question, I mean, I'm always interested in reversals and I'm interested in the surprising places, like surprises in life. So, so yes, there's, there's, the, there's the notion that, you know, parents teach their children. But of course, that's a myth. <laughs> you know, um, I think, I think, uh, I think if, if, something's, if something's working out, then lessons come from all directions. I mean, I'm a new mother, as I keep saying, and I, my children are my classroom. Like, there's no question that they're teaching me to, to be better, to be zen. I mean, firstly, with toddlers, you just have to be zen. Otherwise, it's a disaster, you know, because they're, they're wild. So you, you've got to, like, hum and wusa your way through, through your parenting. But um, I do, so I, I like what you sort of point to there, because I think, I think that's true. I think that too much we imagine this kind of linear experience um, when in fact it's cyclical I guess as, as essays say like it can work in both directions and but but I think particularly it doesn't work in the other direction enough or we don't take enough lessons from our from our children because the assumption is because they're small or they're new or they can't really talk or whatever you know, a baby, a baby can teach you so much. If you just watch a baby for a couple of minutes, you just think, wow, okay. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I, yeah. So I, I just like that reversal. Um, and what was your second question again about? Um, about me? the way a male author versus a female author. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. Let's ask the male authors here. I mean, I, I, 
I think I think if if you're doing, I mean, fine, we can never help what we are. But I mean, if you're, I mean, some a lot of some writers write an opposite gender or a different kind of gender. So 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 sometimes you have male writers who whose characters are female, you know, or they might be writing two women, you know, having a sexual encounter, or they might, you know, who knows what they'll be writing. Or so. So I mean, I think. I think I think part of what it is to write is also to give up identity, you know, give up your identity so that you can do the work, right? And not not hold on to your identity and your ego. And so I mean, when you read those those stories where you're like, oh yeah, I can tell it's a guy, I mean, maybe they're it's not that well written, like they're because they're, they're, they're being the guy and it has to be all about, I don't know, the penis and Whereas if, if you just try and like, okay, what's what's the scene? What does the scene want to be versus what you know? I think sex should be, or I've experienced it as, or whatever. Um, but I mean, I, I think a more interesting question is is sex in general. Like how how, how much do we write about desire? I, I mean, I, my book is not just be be aware. It's not full of sex actually. I mean, I deliberately I didn't want to write something titillating. That's not this book. I, I wanted to. And particularly because I was exploring BDSM and a particular lifestyle that is often maligned and receives a lot of judgment and in the media is used to titillate or is, is dark, you know, if it's like dark. And so I didn't I didn't want any of that. I wanted to write something almost bland and factual. I did quite a lot of research and I, I people were kind and, and, and showed me and explained things to me. And I try and just factual stuff you know um so it's not so so in some ways i wouldn't say this is the book to go to for for like uh, amazing sex scenes but i'm interested in people writing that particularly us as pe you know people on the continent writing yeah. uh, i think i think a lot of people and maybe because of religious le readings or whatever we we sort of step lightly on that or we think oh you know it, it's 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 for private it's not for literature of course it's for literature you know, everything's for literature, including sex and desire, especially. And um, I, I guess also because my characters are old or elderly, people think, you know, these are people that don't have desire and don't have sex lives. Of course, that's a lie. Yeah. So so I'm, yeah, I'm very interested. That's another thing I'm really interested in. And I hope, I hope there's more opportunities for me to keep learning how to write that. And as you say, write it well, not write it as a woman or as a man, but like as a as a creative project. Okay. Yeah. So I want to, I'm going to invite, um, if, yeah, Pihelo, um, in a bit, right? So Pihelo, I want to invite you to, because you're, you're an author. I don't think you do a lot of fiction, but you do, so, but I mean, you can still talk from the perspective of, of a male author and whether you think it's true that men struggle to write. He disappeared, he disappeared. Yeah, he right away. <laughs> Yeah, so anyway, okay, no problem. But the other thing I actually wanted, because on this issue about writing sex, so the last story that I tried to write, and I say tried because I never finished it, it was gonna be um a, it was gonna be a short story and it was going to be about um a relationship, a very turbulent relationship between two men. So um and I just had this idea because I didn't know a lot about obviously about um you know, love or sex between men. And I then tried to do some research. So I, I went on some message boards to see what some men were saying. And it was there that I got the impression slash idea that when not managed properly, um, I, I, in fact, I don't even know what, what I should say, what I shouldn't say. But then the way I now okay. added it to the story was that I implied that the first time that those two men had sex, it was almost like one was raping the other because I just got the impression from reading some of those message boards that um, it could be quite violent if, you know, in some circumstances, you know, if especially the other person wasn't, you know, ready. And, but I abandoned that story because I started to struggle with um, legitimacy issues. Like, you know, do I have the rights to write about this? What if my reading is very wrong? What if like even me insinuating that, you know, the first time was rape and then the guy later fell in love with the other guy, is that problematic, you know, um, one way or the other? And it's really about this issue because I was initially writing that in response to a call for African erotica, right? Um, 
I mean, like I said, some writers here, what would you, I mean, you've already said some things, but then how would you advise people to really go about um, exploring some of these themes in their writing, to expressing some of these things? Is it better to, you said you did some research, exactly how did that, re how did you do that research? Was it from talking to people? Was it from reading other books? How did you try to ensure that it was as, authentic as possible because now these are characters that are not um that are a little bit not similar to you so a 60 year old woman right and just trying to make sure that you know you're making her as authentic as possible as far as she's expressing herself in in a sexual situation yeah yeah i mean it's tough i so you said a lot i mean the one thing i was thinking though as you you were speaking is you know, the, 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 the idea of the first encounter being violent wouldn't be obviously specific to, to, to gay men, right? So that's actually a common story I hear if I speak to um, uh, heterosexual friends of mine, you know, so, so that's also interesting to know that, well, maybe it's, so it's not necessarily the orientation that brings the violence. Um, and and that's, a way, that's a way to enter that story because you can say, yeah, I can understand that, even, even as a woman or as a heterosexual a person, if you are, uh, or whatever, you know, if, if, if so, so, so yeah, there, there, there are ways to feel, um, to, to, for something to be familiar, surprisingly familiar, even if it is, even if the identity is, is on the surface quite different. Um, you're talking about something complex and layered, so I want to find ways to answer it. I mean, one of the first things I would answer is research. So I went online as well, and I, I actually joined. Um, there's an online space called Fet Life, Fetish Life. I joined, I created a profile for myself. Um, and when I was approached, you know, as you approached on these um, forums, um, I didn't approach anybody myself. I just waited for people to approach me. And when they did, I would often say, you know, I'm also a writer. I'm working on this book. Um, I'm also a human being and I'm genuinely curious, but, uh, but I'm also looking to understand something so that I can write. And, and I often say, I'm not writing about you. You're not my character. Like, I'm not going to take your story. Um, but I will, I want to be educated, you know, by what you can tell me. And, and people some people were generous some people disappeared which is fine and some people stayed and would let me chat with them or we would meet um and I met I met one person and someone else I was able to interview online um I reached out also to a very well-known sex therapist in South Africa whom I thought would might know people in the lifestyle um and she did and connected me with with people so, so I mean, I think I think the message boards are good, but if I think I think you have to be brave and bold and push in and ask people, and some people want to educate and and be of help or service. I mean, it's obviously not if they don't, then what they don't have to be burdened with that, but some people do. Um, so, and that's part of the I think that's part of the joy of writing is is, is discovering people and discovering things and learning and. Uh, I met an amazing woman who's a dominatrix here in Joburg and she let me visit her home and we went into her dungeon and it was actually sitting above her living room and she had an incredible story I, absolutely I mean I don't I even say very little about her with it when I talk about the book because I think her story is so amazing and I said you need to write your own story please write your story down and I'm not gonna steal any of it or mm. or tell it before you decide to um so, I mean, I think, I think research, like research, go as deep and as far and as wide as you can. Um, I, I, yeah, you know, I, I, I don't have to go into the gory details, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, but uh, it certainly is fun, you yeah. know, it can be fun exploring something like, like this. And uh, I, I, I definitely didn't put myself in, in any danger, but sometimes you might, I'm not advocating that, but I'm saying, I'm saying for me that that's the research that matters firsthand stuff mm. you know so so and this is not I don't think that gives credibility I, I I'm definitely not so I can't claim to follow this lifestyle in any serious way apart from the fact that I don't consider myself pure vanilla as they say you know I, of course I'm um, I think I think I'm a fairly explorative person an open person versus sort of missionary 
Can you? Uh, this is becoming. This is uh, this is this is becoming a. This is Friday night after all, right? <laughs> Don't but, worry, uh, the Abu Jali Troy Society, you know. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yes. Over yeah. eighteen, over over eighteen, strictly <laughs> over eighteen. But but I mean, but I mean, go for it. And I, you know, I I certainly contemplated. I met somebody who was like he he was a sadist, and he was he was like you know, if you want to have a session. And I thought about it, you know, I contemplated it. I, I was in a fairly delicate state at the time, I would say, um, mentally. And so I, I probably thought, okay, probably not wise. And I wasn't sure I trusted him. I think that's the kind of thing you have to really be certain that you trust someone. But mm -hmm. so I'm saying all of that to say that um, you, this thing of, of, of the, the questioning that you then went through, which I admire, I think that's your, I, I don't believe that I, I'm really not somebody who's like cultural appropriation. You're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed, oh, you're white, don't do that. Oh, you're black, don't do that. Not because I don't understand the politics of that. Of course I do. And I know that our stories are delicate and I, our wounds are deep. And sometimes when someone else comes and pokes their nose into that wound, it's painful. I know that and I respect that. But I think that we get into a lot of trouble. We get into the weeds when we start policing what you can and can't create. The whole point of this is that you know you, yeah. you, you're making stuff you go and you make your thing when you've made it bring it here into the forum and we'll have a look and we'll tell you if you did good or not right so so it's so so do what you want actually write what you like uh, 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 as Biko said but also know that you what you make will be judged mm. and, and and be up for that as well be gracious enough to also be up for that and be up for correction and input. Um, and so I think that's the equation. Um, yeah. So I would really encourage you, it's an, it's an experiment. It's always an experiment. Do I know how to write about a 60 year old? I mean, I'm 20 years away from that or probably a little less than 20 these days. Um, do I know how to write about a, a woman whose daughter takes her life. I mean, my God. And, and it's interestingly, in writing this book, there were times when early on in the book, Yinka doesn't take her life. Because I was just like, I am not writing that book. That is like, I have no right. What do I know? It's too much. It's sensationalizing something that's very painful. You know, all sorts of things, similar to some of what it sounds like you were saying to yourself. Um, but in fact, this was the story. And it was my agent who just said, you know, your idea, if this is the story, you know, then your job is to be brave enough to say, okay, you know what? I'm gonna try. I don't, I don't think I know how to, I don't have the personal experience, but I'm a creative person, right? So I'm going to try and it's an experiment and I'll either make it, not make it or somewhere in between. So I encourage you to go back to it whenever you're ready and, and try, who knows? Maybe there's some, you know, great piece of, of writing that, 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 that you can offer the world. Um, sometimes distance, sometimes not being the thing has you write about it powerfully, mm -hmm. you know, but you have to bring to it humility. You need to do your sort of due diligence, do your research. I would, I would say if you only went to the forum, try and strike up some engagement with people, ask people, say that you're researching, you know, just be open and honest. Like, that's all I got, you know, I can just research. I can't, I can't do much else. Um, but this whole thing of what are we allowed and not allowed? Yeah, I think, I think, I think we need to try and then, and then, and then see and check and try again and see and check. But I love that you, I think it's important to have the quick, because some writers don't give a damn. And, like, oh, and I think that's also problematic because there's an arrogance to that that probably will have you fall down the stairs in your attempt. Whereas I think the person who has doubt and is wondering and checking and I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, brings a sensitivity to those kinds of materials that is needed. Mm. Well, <laughs> I'm so glad that this has been, I mean, it's been recorded because you've said a lot that um, I think I'd even love to go back to at some point. So I think Pahelo is now back in the room, but then it would also be, oh, John, you have a question? Just okay. a comment. Okay. One of the things that Shakespeare's commentators say was greatest about Shakespeare was that he could write from any perspective, king or beggar, uh, drunkard or sober. Uh, and you mentioned, Leon uh, was it imitating Leonardo? Leonardo? Byron said, 
try to be Shakespeare, leave the rest to fate. <laughs> yeah, Re reach, reach for the, yeah, yeah reach. Um, sorry that I, I dropped off, you know, <laughs> it was the internet. But then I think uh, Blessing also had a question. Blessing, are you there? Yes, I am. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I did have a question. I had like a comment and it was about the imposter syndrome question, question you asked the other time. I just wanted to say that even though I've been enjoying the conversation all this while, I really loved that question when you asked it because it's something I struggle with myself and I loved her answer. And I was just going to say that the answer when she was talking about, you know, the, when you were talking about um, writing a character instead of writing, like, like being so bothered about whether you're getting it, whether you're getting an authentic character or not. Mm -hmm. It reminded me of what Chimamanda said in, about when she was writing, I think his name was Richard in Half of the Yellowstone. She said she, she tried to write Richard. He was the most difficult character, I think she said, while she was writing that book because she kept writing him and just kept feeling that she wasn't, she wasn't representing him well enough as a white man in Nigeria. And at some point she just said, well, Richard is a man. And I'm just going to write about Richard as a man, the way I know that men behave or how I would just write a male character. And that was how she was able to you know, mm -hmm. solve that problem. So thank you very much for that answer. It really struck, struck something in me. That's just what mm -hmm. I wanted to see. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Blessing. I think that's interesting and I think, it's also true. I mean, I, I get these questions often because most of my characters aren't me. Like in Bomboy, my main character is 18 and he's a boy. He's a mixed race boy. Um, the woman next door, both characters are 80 in their 80s. And um, one is black, one is white. And an and unusual grief, yes, you know, um, which is still at 60. So often people ask about this question. And, and I think I think one, one story I like to tell when I was writing Bomboy actually, um, Leke is the main character and I was doing my thesis and I had a session with a visiting lecturer, supervisor who asked for some one-on-one -on -one sessions. I booked my session and I went to him. And he, you know, the first thing he said was, you know, yeah, you don't, don't worry about getting the voice right. You know, I think you, you're fine with that. And I was so struck because I was like, I hadn't been worried. You know, it wasn't something I was worried about. And I think the reason is my approach, again, is not, oh, I've got to get the voice right. I'm not a young boy, so I've got to get the voice right. My approach is, again, back to this process, this guy exists. Leke exists. He's out there in the world somewhere. And I'm interviewing him, trying to discover who he is. So I don't have to make him up. He's there already. And um, he's there whole and real and as authentic as any of us are authentic. And my job is just to take, take him down on the page. And, and if, you think of, if you think of it that way, of course, it's, a, it's like a, a mental play with myself, but it's useful because it means that if you, if you think of someone that already exists and you're just trying to put them down on the page, well, that's your, like your character. So just, just relate to it that way. And it takes a lot of the pressure off, like you're writing, you know, you have to, you have to sub somehow deliver and you have to live up to this expectation of getting something right. Um, the other thing I think is, I mean, a little bit cute and Disney, but we, we are more similar than we are different in some ways. Mm. Um, at, at the very human level, we, we suffer, we, ha we have fears, yeah. we have mistakes, we have regrets, we love we're hurt, we're brokenhearted, we, you know, in many basic ways. And, and I love that Shakespeare reference, uh, John, because he's right, of course, if you think of Shakespeare, he, the guy just, you know, wrote everything and, and all things. He wrote women and look at Lady Macbeth, like he, you know, and, and what's great, like, it's not some simpering woman, you know, he's, he's able to write characters that have complexity and layers and, and, and ambition and desire and they can kill and they can, you know, so yeah. what freedom, 
give yourself that permission. Absolutely. Yeah. Adlo, <laughs> this year question is coming at nine o'clock. <laughs> Okay, so maybe we can have two more minutes. Um, so there's a question from Adlu here. It says, uh, coming from someone having coming from having someone tell you I rest my case to the mother or not. Adlu, can you ask the question? I'm, it seems like I'm really. Uh, I, yeah, I get, I get, I think I get what they're saying. So coming yeah. from having someone tell you I rest my case to the mother or not factor in writing your book, and now that you're a mother, do you feel there are some things in your book? that you would not have written differently now with your mother. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, what I, what I, somebody was asking me whether, whether I would write the same book now that I'm a mother. So it's a similar question. And one of the things I, I thought was, I probably couldn't write the book now. You know, I'm, like it's painful to, to think of what it, what it can be to, to lose a child, to lose a child, period. And then to, and then the, the added, confusion of losing a child that chooses to take their own life um maybe i'm too close now i have kids <laughs> you know it's it's too it's too close to think of it and i think inside like i said to to tenure last sometimes distance allows you to write about something um so 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 i could i, I you know i obviously researched and 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 tried to have empathy and all of those things but i had some distance from it um and so, and so, yeah, I don't think I would, I, I don't, I don't think I'll have written it at all to talk of what I'll have changed from, from the book. I think I needed to write it when I, when I needed to write it. As I say, I'm writing more now about motherhood in a, in a more biographical way. And that's interesting because I'm, I'm trying to write my own story, but also write my mother's and my grandmother's stories. So yeah, different project. Yeah. I mean, you and Dave, I know it's 10 p.m., or past 10 p.m. where you are now. This has been brilliant, you know. Um, Thank I mean, you so much. In, the, in, in all honesty, it's, I feel like we could go on talking for, for a while because I really like the way you, I mean, your approach to things and the way you think about things and the way you express them. Um, I think, uh, I mean, like I told everyone, the book is available at Rovin Heights, I believe, and Rovin Heights is in Abuja and in Lagos. And uh, I believe they also offer delivery, so you can probably um, get them, bring it to you. Since now we're very lazy, the middle class and Nigeria are very lazy. We like them to bring everything to us <laughs> in our houses. It's also on Amazon, so you can get it as a as an EPUB, so on Amazon Kindle, so everyone can access it um, or wherever. Uh, it's obviously an incredible book, and of course, Iwande has two other books, um, Bomboy and The Woman Next Door, that you can also explore and read. It's been so amazing having you. I hope that um, we get to have you even another time in the Abuja Literary Society space or the Abuja, Abuja Literary and Arts Festival space, you know. Um, thank you for taking the time to join us. Thank you for writing your book. Thank you for sharing all of these things with us in a very open manner, even as writers, you know, we've learned a lot from, from you as well. And I thank you to everyone that joined. Um, thank you for participating. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your comments. Um, thank you for making this very interesting for me and I'm sure for, for you one day um, too. Uh, again, it's the Abuja Literary Society. It's our book jam event. We have events every Friday um, in the month, uh, poetry events. We have a book club and then we have the book jam where we talk to um, an author. Well, next month, we're gonna the book jam is going to be an open mic, so a poetry event with a poetry group um, somewhere in Africa, um, just so that we can have like a joint session and, you know, poets and exchanging but then it's been it's been lovely you know today uh i this is a great space i just need to say it's really wonderful what you have going on here it's, it's yeah it's 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 wonderful to have that camaraderie and it's so great to just yeah sit with with other writers and just talk about writing we're all we're all endeavoring you know we're all missioning in our own spaces so i i really appreciate it and um it's been wonderful thank you so much and I say thank you to Pehelo too for making the connection, you know. So yes. Pehelo and our Hello. connect. <laughs> but He's undercover. He's undercover. <laughs> we watch, I was trying to put him on the spot, but then he ran away. But Pehelo, thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>
<laughs> and um yeah i mean let's so have a lovely weekend i hope you have a lovely weekend you and i hope it's a bit restful and you're able to relax a little bit even with the baby boys um and to everyone else too i hope you stay out of politics this weekend this weekend doesn't concern yeah. too much <laughs> so stay let's see how, how things go stay safe and have a lovely friday evening okay thank you Take care. Thank, thank you, you. Bye, bye everyone bye, bye. Thanks, you and they. I really Cheers. love it. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.